Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Matthews. I am here with Kristen Karinko. We are so excited to get together today to provide this training for you. Um, and we're really glad that you have decided to join us, that you value this topic and that you are interested in learning more. So before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of the training, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping um, and then I will pass it over to Kristen. So for those support coordinators who are joining us today live on the call, um, this is a training that will be offered for continuing education credit. As we do every month, that information will be provided at the end of the call. So um, please make sure that you, you stay for the whole training, you, you um, interact and, and are a participant of the training, and then um, at the end of the call, there will be a comprehensive assessment, which um, you will complete, and um, depending on your score, you will receive credit. So um, for those of you who are here for credit, uh, stay tuned for more information on that. The other thing that we are doing today that is slightly different from some of our past trainings is um, we'll have some interactive poll questions. So depending on if you've been on webinars in the past um, or this might be brand new to you, we have um, questions that we will pose throughout the training that will pop up on your screen and um, you will have the option to click your answer. And then um, once we close the poll, we will actually share those results with you. So it's a little bit of um, taking a pulse of the audience to see how you guys feel and think about certain things that um, Kristen is speaking about today. But also it is a way for us to learn from you to hear your opinions and know where where um, you feel about different things. So when those poll questions pop up, we are asking to please answer. We'd like to know and hear from you. So um, please take the, the moment to read the question and answer how you feel is um, best representative of you and your feelings. So um, today we are talking about trauma-informed care. Um, Kristen Karinko is our behavior analyst at the state office, and uh, she has put together a wonderful presentation for you all. So with that, Kristen, I will pass this over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, and good morning, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I hope all of you are healthy, well, and safe. Um, I know that we are experiencing and living through uncharted uh times basically uh and not to add insult to injury uh we have the pandemic we have schools reopening and now uh the uh the the double-edged sword of living in paradise is sometimes you have to deal with the weather factors that you can't control so uh that's the first point i want to make is is just i hope that all of you are well the second, before we start um, moving forward with this presentation, uh, I'm, I'm thanking all of you for joining us today. I realize that this is a very uh, controversial um, topic. And with that being said, it's also one where people reach out because they really want more information with regard to this issue. So first question, why is a behavior analyst presenting on something that would be typically presented uh, more so from someone representative of mental health? Well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I'm, I walk along a different path. I'm not only a behavior analyst, a very proud member of the behavior analytic community for over 30 years, but I also have been a mental health counselor for equally that long as well. And being able to see both sides of the coin per se, I think has helped tremendously over the years uh, with being able to take a step back, look at current situations, assess it for function from the behavior analysis perspective, 
but also dig deep into the why, dig deeper into what happens to people, okay? So first and foremost, I wanna stress, you are valued. You as support coordinators, ROMs, uh, uh, CEOs of companies, family members, stakeholders, consumers, every single one of you, every single day, you have value, you have merit, you contribute, you shape, you reinforce, and you dig deep to ask those questions that need to be asked. You are valued, and I hope that you remember that each, each day that you wake up and you're able to share part of yourself with your consumers and their stakeholders and families. Next slide. You wanna do your poll question? Sure. Uh, let's go ahead and start with the first question. This is, uh, again, this is just assessing whether or not any of you have had any previous training regarding this issue that we're talking about today. Uh, trauma, trauma-informed care. So I'll give it a few minutes. So for those of you who have not used polling in a previous webinar, um, by now you should have on your screen a blue box that has um, a question, um, a yes or no question. Go ahead, select either yes or no, um, depending on your, um, your experience, and, um, and we'll collect that and, and show you all the, the results in just a moment. Wonderful. Okay. So the majority of you, 63%, thank you for your responses. 63% of you have said no, and 37% of you have said yes. So thank you for all, you know, thank you for attending this. And obviously it's a topic perhaps that you would like more information on. So this is just the beginning. We're opening up uh, work groups on trauma-informed care, as well as trauma-informed behavior analysis. So there is definitely more to come. Okay, we can close that out. Next slide. So what is trauma? Well, when you think about it, it is the emotional response to crisis situations, and these are some examples of crises that we have or are currently dealing with. Another definition from SAMHSA is in an individual trauma results from an event or a series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as overwhelming or life-changing and that has profound effects on the individual's psychological development or well-being, often involving a physiological, social, and or spiritual impact. That's a pretty hefty definition and it encompasses a lot of the different variables and factors, person within the context of their environment, uh, situations that you can and can't control. Uh, so we will be discussing uh, those issues. Next slide, please. The pre-webinar question and uh, suggestion that went out was for you to take a look at this particular TED Talk. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, she is a pediatrician and she has ascended, basically, up the ranks and is now in the uh, state of California, uh, the uh, Surgeon General. She gave this 
brief, albeit probably 18, 19 minutes, I think, Elizabeth, we timed it. Yes, it was about 15 to 18 minutes. Okay. Uh, about the effects of childhood trauma situations that include things like child abuse, uh, domestic violence in the home, drug abuse, alcoholism of a parent, incarceration of a parent, uh, passing, divorce, uh, a lot of different issues that could potentially occur during a childhood. Uh, and how those particular events affect the growing development of a child. And it was quite interesting, and I hope that all of you took the time to uh, re you know, review that video. It spoke volumes to me when I first saw it because I sat back and I thought, finally, somebody gets this. It's there is a definite connection between the circumstances and events that occur within an environment and how that affects not only the physiological development but also the psychological uh, emotional development and, um, and and developmental stages you can go to the next slide we have a second poll question for everyone so i'm going to go ahead and share that okay so just trying to get a feel for how you are feeling today. Again, this is uh, this is anonymous. There's a Likert scale from great to poor. So just answer it honestly. We'll give it a few minutes or a minute or two. Yes, Kristen, thank you for reminding me. The poll questions are anonymous. So although you are the one answering the question, the um, the platform does not collect your name. So the way that you vote or the way that you respond is not tied to um, anything that we would know who answered what. Oh, this is wonderful. Okay. Ah, all right. Thank you so much for responding. We have uh, we have a bell curve. How about that? Uh, <laughs> we have 18% of you said great. I, I hope that this being a Friday uh, helps with that. Good. I'm adaptively managing my stress. 36. That's wonderful. The majority of you. Uh, answered good. Average, actually, we have a little bit of a warped bell-shaped curve. That's okay. Uh, moderately stressed some of the time, and then 21% answered fair or poor. Um, I'm hoping that uh, by the end of this, we can kind of give you some techniques or give you some resources in order to pivot and look elsewhere for um, some resources and intervention strategies to help with that stress. So thank you very much for responding. I think it also illustrates a point though, go to the next slide, please. It illustrates a point how the stressors, chronic stressors need to be addressed and dealt with so that we can avoid, we can head off long-term effects. When a trauma happens, and again, it's the subjective experience of certain stressors that occur, it can be conceptualized, according to Viktor Frankl, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation. A lot of questions that I've received when I've worked private practice for many, many years, folks come in because they've had some kind of event, whether it be uh, death of a spouse, a uh, significant loss of a coworker. Uh, the first question they say is, am I crazy? Am I supposed to not be sleeping? Am I, why am I, why can't I just bounce back? And the response that I give is, your reactions may seem abnormal because they're out of sync with you right now. However, you are responding typically to this abnormal situation. So, for example, the ongoing pandemic, 
that has abated in some areas of Florida. However, a lot of you who are on this call, I looked geographically from the regions that you represent, a lot of you are very much knee deep still in in the uh, in the effects of the of the pandemic. So you're still having to go through every day managing certain circumstances, not only for yourselves and your families, but also for the consumers and their stakeholders and families that you serve as well. So just thinking in terms of the effects of trauma, we need to confront them, we need to recognize them and try to normalize them so that we can go ahead and effectively deal with them. Okay, next slide, please. So what triggers a trauma? Well, there are a variety of different precipitating factors and events, and I think it's safe to say that if you look at the grand scheme of things across this, some vary in severity than others. Uh, like, for example, um, abandonment, neglect, separation. Separation may be healthy for some, for some folks, but may be traumatic for others. Uh, if you look at most recent times, pandemic aside, and you look at what has happened in this country with regard to racism uh, and uh, the, the need for uh, confronting these issues and, and really making some changes, those produce some traumatic events. They also may trigger uh, harken back to previously experienced traumatic events for some folks as well. Witnessing violence, bullying, and cyberbullying. Cyberbullying in particular, since we spend so much time connected to our phones and computers, uh, the risk of cyberbullying uh, is has increased. Uh, so just taking a look at some of these, these events and some of these issues, this pretty much captures uh, most of them. All right, next slide, please. So the very first thing that you need to do after you recognize what are the triggers is to sit back and think to yourself, okay, how can I identify and address this issue moving forward. You exude something that's referred to as empathy. And a lot of you who are behavior analysts on this call, you may be scratching your head saying, okay, well, that's mentalistic. How? Uh, what's an empathic behavior? Well, you can display empathic behavior using these these strategies and using these uh these mind this mindset in order to move forward number one you ask the underlying question not what did you do but what happened to you when you rephrase that and you ask that question it prompts the person on the receiving end to really open up and talk about or communicate what exactly has been experienced. You also need to look at symptoms and how people adapt to traumatic events. A lot of times what ends up happening is we have a trigger. We have a traumatic event that might have happened um, in our past. I know I've shared with some of you on a previous uh, webinar, 9-11 in my family is a particularly stressful time. Uh, we lost uh, my cousin in, um, top, in the top of the world uh, of the Trade Tower on 9-11. He was a sous chef. So every time around that, every year around that time, it's, uh, it's particularly stressful. Uh, unfortunately, my family has gotten a little bit smaller uh, over time, and uh, it's even more of a traumatic event. So those are some things that I know that are sensitive to me. So I need to basically, okay, recognize that time is, is a trigger and how do, how do I adapt? How do I cope? Uh, those adaptations to those traumatic events. So what do I do? Well, I flip the script. 
I go out to eat with my boyfriend and uh, enjoy life and eat maybe some particular uh, food items that my cousin were, you know, was famous for. Chicken paprikash is huge in our house, okay? Um, and just shifting over and flipping the script on that and using something else, moving it forward. Not necessarily to be in denial, but to deal with those symptoms that I feel and keep it moving. Also, when you are empathic and when you are engaging in communication with folks, healing does happen, okay? I, I talk a lot about how grief and loss that might have occurred due to a trauma, unexpected or long-term, uh, healing does happen. It takes time. You shouldn't let anybody put periods on your grief period. You also should not uh, tell people, okay, you've grieved enough. You also should not expect to move from stage one to two to three to four to five through the grieving process. You move through these particular healing stages at your own pace. And if you are empathic, if you are displaying empathic behaviors through your relationships, healing does happen. Okay, next slide, please. So in the actual published research, peer-reviewed journals uh, and operational definitions of the three E's of trauma, we talk about those precipitating events. We talk about the subjective and objective experiences of trauma, and then the long-term or short-term effects of trauma. So let's talk about events. I think it's safe to say that the, when I showed you or when, when the slide was up, that had the description of uh, the different events, they ranged in levels of severity. Uh, they also impact uh, differently. And what might be traumatic for one person might not be stressful and traumatic for another. Experience, when you look at the individual's experience of that event and determining whether or not it is truly traumatic, you take a step back and you think to yourself, well, how am I gonna know if it's traumatic if I don't see outward demonstrative behaviors? You might see people becoming more reclusive. They, they may be shutting down. I know with, uh, with a lot of our folks, what you might see is, uh, someone who may be very, uh, very talkative one day, all of a sudden something happens. Let's say, for example, uh, one of their housemates in their group home is being hospitalized. And to compound matters, typically, if it's somebody who has high risk, if they have multiple medical issues where perhaps they've been frequently hospital hospitalized over their life, if their, if their housemate is buddy-buddy, if they're BFFs, and they like to go to the hospital and visit when they're going to get, you know, a pick line for uh, uh, something along the lines of, of treatment, or they have to have IV fluids because they're dehydrated, and that typically happens because of a medical situation or diagnosis that they have. But for whatever reason, uh, at this point, they're hospitalized, and their friend that they usually go see in the hospital, they are being denied access because of COVID. Well, we don't allow people to go in and visit or, you know, visit them, uh, visit folks that are in the hospital right now due to the COVID contingencies. That could be very traumatic for that person. And you may not even know, but if you watch for behavior changes, if you listen for what they're telling you, uh, either through the spoken word, uh, through their behaviors, through their actions or inactions, you can assess the experience. And then the effects. They include physical, social, emotional, spiritual consequences. I know uh, I have a very good friend who um, is a minister. And one of the conversations that, that he and I have, have shared recently is the increased prevalence of the anger that his congregation has been experiencing and been discussing. And 
he you know, talked to me about how, uh, from a pastoral standpoint, uh, he needs to look at it one way, but he's also a clinical therapist. So he's trying to mitigate and he's trying to weigh out how he can help best help his congregation through this. So spiritual consequences is one, uh, one of the potential effects. Social effects, I think we are seeing that. A lot of people out of fear can come anger a lot of times. Um, fear is a very motivating, albeit both good and bad, potential effect in response to a trauma. Typically, we see people who may be walking around very, uh, like they're in a fugue state, they're, they're very numb, they are in denial, and then it moves from shock to anger. So that could be one potential initial effect, or what we refer to as proximal, it's very close to the actual event. But then every time something similar happens or occurs, whether it's it occurs directly to them or someone that they know that's very close to them, or they see a situation on the news, it could trigger, okay? So we have to be mindful of these three E's and what it dictates or how we can go ahead and plan accordingly in the future to intervene. All right, next. So looking at the experience of trauma, okay, we look at those WH questions. I know I talk a lot about that in behavior analysis classes. Who, what, why, when, how, we're looking at setting events. We're looking at how it occurred, when, where, how often. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the examples that Dr. Nadine Burke Harris gives in her TED Talk is, why is uh, trauma so impactful on children, especially if it's recurring events of trauma? And she talks about comparing it to a situation in which you were in a forest and you're running from a bear you know, fight or flight, okay? Well, a traumatic experience, if it occurs often, that could be like being chased by the bear every day. It can be uh, very similar to uh, experiencing if a bear was chasing you every night, if the bear came home every night with you. So those events and those, those frequencies, those setting events are very critical as far as how severe or how much of an impact people experience due to trauma. All right, next slide, please. Effects. We talk a lot about short-term and long-term effects, okay? Uh, initially, when a trauma happens, we have coping strategies. Sometimes they're healthy coping strategies. For example, if you are someone who experiences a loss, experiences some traumatic events, if you look at the situation and you pivot and you say, okay, I'm not gonna let this, dis I'm not gonna let this immobilize me, I'm gonna pick myself up and I'm gonna keep it moving. And you plug through, like so many of you do. Um, you have a situation that occurs, you have uh, a loss, you have uh, financial issues, you have emotional issues at home, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you put on your game, put your game face and you walk out and you, and you give your consumers and those families, your staff that you perhaps supervise, you give them your best. You flip the script. So there's effective coping strategies, but then there's not so healthy coping strategies, right? There's unhealthy or maladaptive behaviors. Well, the anger, the, uh, a friend of mine calls it jaded thinking and jaded behavior, you know, where you may be overly pessimistic and it may, it may lead to uh, negative thoughts, negative behaviors. Um, our individuals, a lot of times when we see an increase in maladaptive behaviors, these are some things that need to be going through your mind, okay? Uh, developmental tasks, maybe perhaps on one particular day, 
if uh, they were humming along just fine and you were you were teaching uh, a developmental task that perhaps you and I take for granted, where that person has been working very, very diligently on dressing themselves. All of a sudden they decompensate and they are not focusing or attending to that particular task that you have presented to them at that point in time. Well, that's when the red flag needs to go, you know, it needs to pop up, okay? And you need to take a look at in context. Well, in this group home, there's six, uh, there's six folks that live there. I'm just giving a hypothetical example here. And let's say out of those six individuals that live in that group home, three of them are not there anymore for whatever reason. They may have moved to another group home. They may be, uh, you know, uh, obtaining medical care at this point, or maybe uh, somebody else went home. Maybe they're home for the weekend. You don't know. They don't know. The only perception is that there's loss. Okay. So those developmental tasks need to be looked at very carefully, and uh, sometimes trauma can affect those as well. Physiological responses, we talk a lot about something called the generalized adaptation syndrome. Simply put, okay, you have an alert, you have a, a period of time where you are dealing constantly with that stressor, and then you have exhaustion. Well, if you keep running through that general adaptation syndrome over and over and over again, or perhaps if you superimposed that particular model on top of the pandemic and if you look at the graphic displays of the community phases and the disruption and we're supposed to reach the reconstruction honeymoon phase at some point and at this point it hasn't it hasn't hit in some areas of the country uh, but it has hit in others so just looking at that and trying to put your best foot forward a lot of times that physiological response to that prolonged exposure to trauma can also produce physical decompensation. In other words, you may have blood pressure issues. You may have insomnia. And insomnia, frequent periods of unrest where your body is not letting you get to that restorative level of sleep. We have REM and non-REM. Simply put, Non-REM is, is the stage of sleep where you really feel like you got your rest. REM is where you dream. It's not the restful or restorative phase of sleep. And when you are bombarded with chronic stressors and chronic trauma, your body doesn't allow itself to, to regroup and uh, refresh. Social relationships, albeit, can be strained. One of the other incidents or one of the other intervening variables that's occurring right now 2020 is an election year and there are a lot of people who have very uh strong uh, viewpoints one way or another as far as what what political affiliation you choose to uh you choose to associate with and support and not everybody agrees i think we can agree that not everybody agrees and some people have a, a different way of explaining and expressing their his or her opinion uh, that may be potentially harmful to other people. So taking that into consideration is a big factor as well. Next slide, please. Okay. So These are some of the responses that we've talked about or that you might be seeing, and they come in, they, they basically are categorized behaviorally, emotionally, physically, and psychologically. And I think I pretty much have hit on a lot of them, but this was, this was composed uh, based basically looking at a lot of consumers with whom you deal every day and what you might see things that you may pick up uh, so we have the you know our own subjective experiences and how we respond to trauma events but just taking a look and seeing exactly what's going on with your individuals this is a, a pretty good checklist if you will 
by no means is it all inclusive or exhaustive, but it might get you thinking in terms of, hmm, we need to take a look at that. We need to do what I refer to as a deep data dive, okay? Uh, and really look and see what is happening, what has happened to that person, and what's going on, um, how we can go ahead and plan to intervene. Okay, next slide, please. And there's you. Now, the interesting thing that I, I want you to, if I want you to be able to take away from this training is trauma-informed care. Uh, you may be, you may feel as if at the conclusion of this training that you are a little more trauma-informed than you were at the very beginning. And again, I, I would like to think that I cover everything, but I don't. And I encourage you to seek out additional information. So I'm leaving you with this next step, this next slide, in order to start the ball rolling as far as how you excavate, how you identify, um, and how you posture yourself so that you are being empathic, you're being open and aware, and you can become more informed. Next slide, please. We have a third poll question we would like for you all to consider before um, before Christine gets into the details. Okay. Do you consider yourself a leader? Please go ahead and take a few minutes. And Kristen, while they are um, responding to the poll question, um, we did have a question come through on the chat box. So okay. before we get too far, I just wanted to ask this one. It's from Catherine. She was asking, could you please um, say again the syndrome that, what was the syndrome called regarding the prolonged impact of trauma on, um, I think it was slide 10 that you were referring yep. to? It's referred to as the general adaptation syndrome. I just typed it in the chat box. Great, if, thank you. Can you see that? I do not, but I will type it. General, okay. say it one more time. General adaptation syndrome. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. And if anybody, one of the things with regard to this poll, I see 37% of as it stands right now, or you can go ahead and close out the poll. Okay. Uh, basically, as it stands right now, wonderful. Well, all of you, all of you, since you take the step every day to become more educated and aware, there's a leader in all of you. Uh, for those of you that are very self-aware, 48%, yes, kudos to you. You rock. We need to continue this. Yes, but I would like additional resources. Absolutely. The strongest leader is someone who can admit their shortcomings and always who strives to be better, basically. So looking for additional resources, I think, is, is incredibly intelligent. And the 15% of you that said no, we just need to reinforce and shape that leadership right out of you because it's there. Okay. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So you are there and you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, well, what do I do in order to get to this information? Well, this is one of the ways in which you can posture yourself in a position to really be respectful how when you are talking and interacting with individuals. Uh, you identify those past and present voices that affect your own behavior, meaning you're doing a self check, okay? And then when you enter into an environment, Here's, here are some things you need to consider. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, respectful, the letters in the word respectful all correspond to one of these issues. So the first, the R stands for religion and spirituality. 
we need to make sure that we are very self-aware of our own uh, morals and values and guidelines and also recognize the fact that the, fo that if the folks that we deal with every day may not share or agree with our own morals and values. They may have different, uh, different ideas, different takes on their particular notion of spirituality and organized religion or, or um, zeitgeist as far as what they uh, under under what conditions they model and shape their own life economics and social class background everybody's experience is different as well so taking that into consideration and really uh, being sensitive and aware of that sexual identity and i also want to include not only are we talking about sexual orientation, but we're also referring uh, here with gender identity. Uh, being respectful of a person's preferences, demonstrative behaviors uh, when it comes to expressing who they are is something that you need to take into consideration. Personal style and education. Now, I had a parent ask me, well, what does that mean? What that means is if you have a 37-year-old uh, a young lady who is still living with you and mom is in her 60s, okay, and uh, your 37-year-old daughter loves, loves the minions. Y'all know who the minions are, okay? Um, I'm not going to try to imitate it, but I just, I, I, I love the minions, okay? Uh, and she has stuffed animals all over her, her room, and it is something that is particularly important and valued to her. Well, that's her personal style, all right? And then you have a situation where you have a provider coming in to, uh, to provide uh, education, perhaps maybe some, uh, some preemptive or prerequisite skills for job coaching. And we're talking about making sure that, okay, well, she's 37, she needs to dress appropriately. And uh, one of the things that we're gonna have to have you do, because this has happened, this is an actual example, is you can't, you, you really shouldn't have your stuffed animals sitting in the background. If you're gonna interview for jobs, they really shouldn't see that. Well, and then this young lady says, but that's who I am. You're asking me to give up who I am. How this relates to being trauma informed is you could potentially be triggering some type of mindset, some type of behavior where she may be less than compliant with what is being discussed or what is being planned for her. And mom sees nothing wrong with it. Mom sees nothing wrong with the minions in the background because that's who she is. So just, just taking that into consideration what a person's personal style and also what their educational background is, okay? I, I usually try to get in at least one dig with regard to my Seminoles and uh, the Gators and the and the Hurricanes this, this year. So here it comes. Not everybody is a Florida State fan. Um, I'm sorry if you're not, okay? Uh, this would be a good place to interject some humor. So uh, I don't know what football season is gonna look like this year, but uh, again, I'm just happy that we are actually having some type of return to normalcy and uh, I have many friends who are Gators and, and Hurricanes as well so but not everybody shares the same education educational level educational background affiliation and being respectful of that uh, is important um, people learn how to cope and their survival skills that you, uh, you and I may not be aware of. Uh, some people are classically educated. Some folks have been uh, more socially educated. And I dare say that uh, the posture that we should take on the receiving end when we are interacting with somebody who has experienced trauma is a one where we are learning from them and trying to capture and see their perception and see the vantage point from their from their position 
ethnic and racial identity is critical. It is something that we need to uh, acknowledge. We also need to recognize our own, what's referred to as implicit biases. And one particular reference that uh, I was made aware of yesterday on a training that was given by the Be Florida Behavioral Health Association is uh, a process where we are posturing ourselves with cultural humility. And what that means is we are recognizing our own limitations, our own biases, and our own identities, and making sure that we put our acknowledge and put our implicit biases aside when we're dealing with somebody who has a different life set of experiences than we do. Okay. It's critical in trauma informed care because no two people experience trauma the same way. So just thinking in terms of all of the events that have occurred and unfolded uh, over the last, I want to say six months, but when you look at racial inequity and inequality in this country, it's been much longer than six months. Uh, I think that it just came to a head, uh, perhaps over the last six months with the pandemic as well. And really putting yourself in that posture to put your implicit biases aside and see things from another person's point of view, I think is incredibly helpful and will speak volumes to the effective relationship and communication that you have uh, with these folks moving forward. Chronological lifespan status and challenges. Uh, if you were raised in the 70s, it's very different from how children are raised today. There are certain situations, intervention strategies. If you look back in our field, now I'm talking to my, my behavior analysts that are out there, um, we have a very dark part of our history. We have a history that includes institutionalizing people uh, using electroconvulsive shock therapy for people who engage in self-injury. Um, and even the vernacular, even the, the jargon that people have used in order to uh, recognize the individuals with whom we serve, albeit it was not people first, it was not person first language. So just taking all of those things into consideration and recognizing that these challenges that exist today are very different, albeit some are worse, some are better um, in our field and, and outward. But taking that into consideration I think is important. The T in respectful stands for trauma and crisis and just acknowledging, you know, what happened to you? What do you want to share? That type of thing, I think, is important. Family background and history is something that we need to take into consideration as well. Uh, from a support coordinator vantage point, when you are looking at resources that are available, you know, is it, are you in a two family household? Is it a single parent with four or five other children who are making demands upon your time and that parent is very, very stressed out? Uh, that is something that really needs to be taken into consideration as well. And then unique physical characteristics. I realize that there are a lot of disabilities that you can't see. However, there are disabilities um, that you can see that are visible and that we need to make sure that we're acknowledging what those are when we're doing trauma-informed interviewing at this point. And then the L in respectful location, 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 and also language differences. Uh, there's also a very good um, interpreter, translator, uh, service provision, I, and I will go ahead and put that up in the chat box or email it to you um, where you can literally get translation in over 50 languages, which looking at our state and how wonderfully culturally eclectic it is, uh, having that resource is incredibly timely and necessary in order to make sure that you and I are communicating effectively and that I'm listening, I can hear and listen and hear what you're saying and understand it. 
that's something that's a skill that needs to be in place when you're doing trauma-informed interviewing. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so when you are proceeding with that interview process, here's a couple of uh, considerations that you need. To, obviously, we are all mandatory reporters when we have a situation that could be considered abuse. Uh, the risk assessment question I'll get to in the next slide. You have an opportunity to really uh, you know, report what you see to your supervisor and also talk with what you should do at that point, um, what that guidance is. Also, when you are assessing safety, are you safe in that environment and are they safe in their environment? If the trauma is ongoing and the threat is not just a perceived threat, but a present threat, you need to assess safety and realizing that many of you are the waiver support coordinator, you need to go ahead and reach out to your liaison. I know that there's a waiver support coordination uh, organization, grassroots effort, talk with your providers, the legal guardian, you can also speak with any of us and please feel free to contact me if you have a, oh, I have this question that I really kind of want to bounce it off of somebody. I'm, I'm here and I'll be more than happy to respond to your, your questions and comments. Next slide, please. So I wanted to try to give you a tool and this was from uh, Camille Kalu and Ken Wynn. Uh, they did a presentation on trauma-informed care back in 2017, and Camille, and we were supposed to present at FABA this year, uh, but because FABA, Florida Association for Behavior Analysis, I try not to speak in letters, sorry, uh, is uh, condensed, this presentation that we're creating and, and uh, presenting will be presented at a later time. However, this tool, I think, is something that you could use and might be handy. It's a flow chart, and it's how do you proceed with that risk assessment? You hear, how do you mitigate risk? You, have you done a risk assessment? What's your contingency plan? And all of these terms, and as a brand new support coordinator, which many of you are, are more novice than some of the more seasoned uh, participants on this call. Some of you may be saying, what in the world are we talking about risk assessment? Well, this gives you a really good start. It just gives you an, op an opportunity to really start thinking. And I believe, Elizabeth, they do have the uh, handouts, correct? Yes, the material will be posted on the APD website on the support coordination page, along with the recording of today's presentation. Wonderful, okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to screenshot this or take it with your phone, don't worry about it. You'll get it. That's not a problem. OK, um, but just going through, you're looking at now you've done the interview. You've reported what you needed to report. OK, so now what? Now when I'm looking at that, are you safe? Am I safe type of question? What are some of the outcomes you're going to? What are we doing? What can we do? What are the potential outcomes if we make these choices? Like, for example, if you have a young person, if you have a consumer who's living um, in a group home and they are being uh, victimized, honestly victimized uh, by another individual in the group home, well, it's pretty clear what you're going to do, okay? But if there's those situations that are more gray, okay, uh, if there's if there's a situation in which you look at and you say to yourself, OK, eh, I've got that hair on the back of my neck standing up feeling, but I can't really prove it. I've done the reporting. I've done the interviewing. But what am I going to do? These are some questions that can guide your process. These are those questions that basically say, OK, well, what are the risks and what are the benefits? And, and um, if it, I, it, meetings all the time when I'm encountered with a challenge or a dilemma, and there's some of you on the call that have heard me say this, okay? What are the risks and what are the benefits? Do the risks outweigh the benefits or vice versa? Because that's going to guide the decision or the recommendation that you make. 
So I hope that this tool will be helpful to you. And ST and LT are short-term, long-term, but just thinking in terms of those questions and how you would go ahead and move through that flow chart and answer that question will help, will help guide your process and it will complete that risk assessment. Document, 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 document. Um, I've seen people actually print this off and write their responses on the actual risk assessment tool. Um, and this is something that I hope to be incorporating as a, as, as a tool moving forward as a resource for providers to use in the future. Okay, next slide, please. All right, brainstorming Q&A. Now I don't I don't see any questions in the chat box, uh, so I, I'm assuming. Uh, oh no, I don't. Okay, I thought I did, but I don't. Um, so I, I apologize, but I will go ahead and prompt Elizabeth to go ahead and uh, and um, uh, read the questions to me, and and I'll be more than I know. We only have a couple minutes left, but uh, as far as the timing. Uh, and understand if you have to skedaddle, uh, but I'll, I'll be more than happy to take some questions uh, before we close for today. So Elizabeth, can I go ahead and tag you in? Sure, so um, I tried to answer the questions that I could answer as for more of, the, of your expertise, we haven't seen too much come in but now would be a great time for us to do our last poll. Okay. So if you have a question, go ahead, put that in, in the chat box. Um, take a moment, answer our last poll. Um, it's mainly about resources. So we're looking to find out if, um, if you know where to find information. Um, and if you don't, um, just click no. Um, but Kristen and I will make sure that all of these resources that we provided today are up on the website. Most likely it'll be Monday afternoon. Yes. Um, we have to have time to edit the presentation today. So yes. this, this will all be available to you um, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I will say too, if you have not been to our website lately, check it out because there is a whole host of uh, behavioral and mental health uh, resources, all of the lists that we have there um, on our website. Oh, wonderful, 75% know how to reach out. That's wonderful. And the 25%, that's okay, we're coaching you up. You're gonna know how to access these re resources or at least get the ball rolling before you clock out of this, uh, this training go to the website and take a look and don't just go to the covid page but take a look at the behavioral services page as well there is a list of, of resources um, and also as elizabeth said uh, the information with regard to uh, this particular training and the resources that have been referenced within uh, will also be listed there um, your contacts and for your contact information on to each of the regions as far as uh, the senior behavior analysts in each of the regions are also there they're just a click away uh, I do want to say as a behavior analyst I don't want to be remiss I, I it takes a team folks okay and first and foremost Amanda Jackson she is a godsend if you know her um, she is absolutely wonderful. I want to also thank Philip Lyons from uh, Sunland and Triple DP for his assistance and uh, additional resources with regard to trauma. Ms. Kalima Muhammad uh, pretty much put the bug in my ear a few, uh, I think it was probably about eight or nine months ago about we need to start talking with our folks about trauma-informed care. And I said, okay. So we did our first training a while back for CMS uh, and licensing folks, and, and you guys uh, have joined us today. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my, my, uh, my co-pilot and uh, my, uh, my, my team member on this uh, endeavor today, Ms. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Matthews. I truly appreciate your assistance and support with navigating this particular training today. 
So um, I don't see or I'm not hearing any other questions or comments. I truly hope that you have uh, gained some uh, takeaways and gained some insight into how to move forward with trauma-informed care. And uh, thank you for all that you do uh, in these challenging times and both, both in, in the pandemic, outside of the pandemic. Please, not, please, re, please, please, please know that we appreciate everything you do and that you are helping to support and provide uh, community inclusion and uh, life and quality of life for our folks. Um, and we appreciate everything that you do. So thank you very much. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kristen. It was wonderful. We had um, a lot of people chime in at the end saying thank you and that they appreciate you and your work. So. As always, I appreciate you too. So, awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for those of you who are joining for credit, I know that you are patiently waiting. So I'm going to go ahead and share your assessment information with you. Uh, this is your link to your test. Um, I also put it in our chat box for those who, um, so you don't have to write it down you know, because it's got all these letters and numbers in it. So uh, the link is in the chat box. It will also be automatically sent to you at noon. Uh, that email, it does come from GoToWebinar. So if you, if it's, you know, 12.05, 12.10, you still haven't gotten the email, just check your junk mail. Um, and we will, we'll figure out where your link went if for some reason you don't get it by, by give it till 12.10. Um, but so um, your assessment, it is open until five o'clock this evening. You um, need to make a 75% or higher on the assessment to earn your credit. At the end of your test, this is very important for everyone to remember, you have access to your certificate. So once that test, once you click submit, you get your grade, your certificate generates. It will be a PDF, so make sure you save that. That is your record of attendance and your record of, of uh, credit, excuse me. Um, so that is what you need to put in your file to show that you joined us today. It also emails to you. So if for some reason you close your, your web browser, you don't get to download the certificate immediately, it should pop up in your email box. So make sure you check those places so that you have um, you have your certificate. The test itself, it opened technically at 11 a.m. I know it's 11.05, um, so give it a minute or two. If everyone is trying to access it right now, you might get an error message. So please, just give yourself, maybe go get a glass of water, uh, get up and stretch, and then come back and take the test. With all of us joining that website at once, sometimes people get error messages. So if after all of that, it's three o'clock in the afternoon and you still haven't gotten your link, you can always email me. I'm happy to share that link with you. I would like for you to take the test. I want you to get your credit. So if it's getting close to the end of the day, and it's not five o'clock yet, just email me and I'll be happy to help you. So um, if there are any questions that come up um, throughout the next couple of weeks as you review the presentation, you are more than welcome to contact me, contact Kristen or contact your regional office. We are all here to help you. Um, we, we want to support you and um, get you through all of this crazy stuff that's happening right now. So we appreciate you for joining. Thank you for taking your Friday morning to spend with us and um, be on the lookout next month. We have a training um, that information will be sent to you. Um, actually, you all will get the registration for next month's training at 12 o'clock. It will be in that same email with your assessment. So I hope you join us and have a wonderful Friday. Thank you all for joining.
by the way, I will keep this up for a few more minutes, but um, if you need to jump off, you can go ahead and jump off. That's fine too. Elizabeth, do you see any other questions? I um I have okay many. now I'm not looking. Uh, okay. We have the PowerPoint. Um, okay, now I can see it. All right. Uh, uh okay. Very good video. It makes you think. Yes, absolutely. Does the language service include sign language? Yes, it does. Uh, how will these language translators work? Please email me. We will go ahead and make that available to you. I will find it. Mm -hmm. um, if we have concerns, do we contact our liaison only? No. You, there's a variety of different folks that you can contact. Um, as part of your waiver support coordination training, from what I understand, I believe, I know that this is something that was in Senate Bill 82 as far as mentoring, but I, real, I, I think that if you reach out to your regions and your regional rep uh, within the APD uh, regional offices, you can help or they can help identify who you can talk with uh, with regard to um, who might be a resource for you. And if all else fails, email me because I have no problem fishing out folks, um, you know, to make sure that you get the accurate, timely, and credible information. Uh, how do you handle falls if they're happening rather often for an individual living in a group home? That's a very good question. The very first thing that we're trained to deal with behaviorally is you're going to rule in or rule out medical. And quite often, you remember, if you think in terms of uh, people who have sleep deprivation, if they have uh, issues where they can't, uh, where this particular incident has really just, for lack of a better way to put it, rocked their world. And where you and I would be able to mitigate and navigate, a lot of our individuals would have a difficult time or it may be even more of a challenge. So what I would do if there's frequent falls, you need to get them to a physician as soon as possible and let them do a full medical check and make sure that you have as much information about what's going on with that person and the duration, uh, whatever time period you're looking at that these falls, these recurrent falls are occurring. I think all of that information and shared with a physician is incredibly important. Let's see what else. Any word or idea about the population of our consumers linked to DCF? Oh, that's a future training. Uh, Veronica, I don't know if you're still on here, but we um, we actually have some internal work groups going on right now uh, to look at those particular issues with regard to the CBCs and our children in um, not only who we serve uh, in, in conjunction with the waiver and uh, Medicaid state plan, but we're also looking at referrals that group homes receive through uh, DCF, Department of Children and Families, uh, and just making sure that we're navigating appropriately and that we're taking all of that into consideration. The trauma-informed training is one step in the right direction because a lot of times behavior analysts will come on board, assess these kids, and through traditional methods of assessment for behavior analysis, most of the time you're not going to capture the trauma history. And that is something that, uh, from a mental health standpoint, i have you know, looking at both sides of the playing field, so to speak, you can capture it. Why does this, why is this child being referred to this group home? Oh, you did a termination of parental rights, a TPR, that's why they're here. So looking at all of that, uh, I think is important. And that's something that from an agency standpoint is, is a very big priority for us. So more to come on that, but don't let the dialogue stop. Keep talking, keep posing those questions as you, as you encounter these situations. Do you address the need to help professionals understand the trauma of making parents repeat the trauma of what the history? I rarely feel that the trauma of having a child, uh, Judith James, I don't know if you're still on, but you're absolutely right. Um, and I agree with you. 
there are a lot of folks, there are a lot of families uh, who don't ever make it past that information that they were given about their child. And I've referred to the dark history in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities. 50, 60, 100 years ago, when a parent had a child with a disability, the doctor would say, and please forgive me, this is a quote uh, from a, a book called Christmas in Purgatory. If you've never seen this pictorial display, uh, please go ahead and take a look at it. It will horrify you. But nevertheless, it will educate you and, be, and help you become a little more sensitized uh, to what the history is. Where a lot of families were said, well, they're never going to progress. I'm paraphrasing now. They're never going to progress, so you might as well go ahead and institutionalize them now. And as a result, we saw a lot of kids being institutionalized. Well, fortunately, flash forward to 2020, that doesn't happen as frequently anymore. Um, but nevertheless, that mindset that that parent has as far as dealing with, I have a child who has a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, or I have a child who has a diagnosis of ASD, autism spectrum disorder, and I don't know if they're going to be able to fill in the blank, whatever the fill in the blank, go to college, do get married, these types of things. Well, for every every fear that a lot of parents have, there are, for every point that they have of, uh, of, of contention or fear or anxiety, there are so many examples out there in the world today of counterpoints to that. You have to look for it. You have to build that bridge there and really instill hope. Now, I'm not telling you to be overly optimistic and unrealistic, but what I'm saying is instead of addressing, instead of focusing and dwelling on what they can't do, what can they do? What can they do? What can you do moving forward to help instill hope with that person? I think is important. Let's see, what else? Okay. Uh, a ray of sunshine. Well, thank you, Miss Smith. I appreciate that. I hope you're still on, as are you. Uh, very good video makes you, yes, yes, yes. Oh, my. I'm just, I'm hoping that I go through all of this. Go Knowles, that's right. Kindred spirit there, thank you. Um, yes, you will receive the slides. Okay, if we have concerns, do we, no. If you have concerns, go up to food chain, talk, to, you know, ask questions as much as you have, uh, as many, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, all righty. My email address, I will go ahead and um, it's K-R-I-S-T-I-N Karinko at APDCares.org. Uh, I see a lot of you on this call. Some of you know how to get in touch with me. That's not a problem. Uh, but please, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Okay, I don't see any other questions on here. Elizabeth, are you still on here? Yes, I'm still here. I'm just okay. responding to people in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, if we get any more questions, we will make sure that um, either Kristen or myself reach out to you. Um, for those of you who had some initial issues with the testing link, uh, please just try again. I just had to make some edits, um, but it should definitely be working now. So if you have trouble, just reach out to me, send me an email, and we'll get you squared away. All right. Thank you all for joining. Have a wonderful Friday. We will talk yeah. soon. Thank you so much, everybody.